Welcome to the Supplement Engineer Podcast. My name is Robert Chinetsky. Today, we are joined by the founder and owner of Performax Labs, Mr. Aaron West. Thanks for joining us today, Aaron. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited to uh, talk to you today. So I always like to uh, start these things out with you and I have known each other for a couple of years now. Um, but for the people that aren't familiar with Performax and the brand, let's uh, go through a little bit of the history. How did you get into the supplement industry and how did you start the brand? What led you to start Performax? Um, I guess that's kind of a, a, a long story, so I'll try and keep it short. Um, but where that would probably start would be, um, I don't know what the year would be, maybe 2004, 2005, um, wrestling in high school when I got into, um, you know, weightlifting obviously is a requirement for, uh, wrestling. And so I started to find that I actually liked the weightlifting a whole lot more, uh, than wrestling. Yeah. And so at that point, what happened is I stumbled across uh, bodybuilding.com mm -hmm. and I stumbled across bodybuilding.com. I became a massive user, uh, on the forums. And mm -hmm. so once I found that wealth of information, um, I just kind of like really, really dive deep into um, all the science and, and, you know, what it takes to make a good product and ingredients and things like that. More so not even of the premise of I want to start my own supplement company, just trying to excel my, myself within weightlifting. Um, so from there, it kind of came to where I'm answering everyone's questions and I'm helping people out as I, uh, you know, started to gain that knowledge. And I was added as a, uh, a forum rep. From a by supplement company. Mm -hmm. So as I started working for a supplement company as a forum rep, I got really close with their formulator and we started working together. And then he would give me little like side projects like, hey, these are the claims we'd like to make. I need you to you know, pull up the study, see if we can make these claims. So I started doing some back end research for that formulator. Then it got to the point that I was actually helping with the formulations. Then it got to the point that I was able to actually put out my own product um, through that company. And this is all like, this is, you know, when forums were, were where it's at, you know, this is 2003, 2004, 2005, maybe 2004, 2005, 2006, somewhere in that range. We still yeah. had Superdraw, we still had Fairflex, we still had all the, the pro hormones, the bodybuilding.com forums were um, bigger than Reddit, I believe at the time. It was literally the biggest online forum. Uh, yeah, like it was golden time. days back in the early 2000s. Exactly, yeah. And so that's where my kind of start, I guess you could say, in the industry came from. Mm -hmm. As I started helping this company, you know, with their formulations and, and uh, kind of growing in that that sense, um, they actually found their own hardships. Mm -hmm. And so I and me and a lot of people from that, you know, from that company stepped away. We just don't want to be involved in it. And at that point, I was picked up or I applied for a local nutrition uh, shop. There's actually a nutrition shop. Mm -hmm. um, and so at NutriShop, I was able to better understand what the consumer wanted as they walked in the door. Whereas when I was working with that supplement company, I was able to understand, okay, well, what does it take to, to take a concept, go through all the proper research um, and formulation to bring a product to the market? But I didn't necessarily understand, well, if someone walks in the store, what are they looking for? Um, and then working at NutriShop and no dig to them, but obviously they have their, their house lines and I was kind of selling, I was kind of having to sell some stuff that I didn't necessarily a hundred percent believe in, mm -hmm. but just kind of had to sell it. So at that point, that's when I kind of realized, all right, I have the back end, um, you know, knowledge of working with directly with the manufacturer and helping bring concept, you know, to concept formulations to, to market. I now have this front end um knowledge of being able to find out what does the consumer really want when they walk into a shop mm -hmm. and that's what kind of started me uh, thinking about hey look i could i could do this i could make uh, my own brand and really what i wanted to do with my brand and it's how i find a lot of these you know supplement companies start is i just want to take pro i just want to make products i want to take you know and for a long time i was just not at scale you know mm -hmm mixing them up myself and having my friends try it. What do you think? What do I, you know, getting feedback. And yeah. it literally got to a point where I'm like, okay, I, I, I have enough knowledge within this that I could probably formulate a better product than a lot of the products on the market. Mm -hmm. And so I came into this trying to make really high quality, really well formulated 
kind of clinically proven supplements back when that wasn't the buzzword. Back yeah. when, you know, we're talking jacked, you know, and, and mm-hmm. micro scoops and, and uh, you know, one gram of arginine with one gram of beta alanine and 400 milligrams of caffeine and it's a prop blend. I just wanted to do something completely different. Yeah. Um, so it's actually funny. So I'm at the LA Fit Expo and I have all these ideas and, and, and I just don't know, you know, who to reach out to within, mm-hmm. you know, contract manufacturing and all that. And there's this little tiny, I guess it's a 10 by 10 booth, but at the time it seemed really tiny. And there's these two guys just standing in the booth, very, very, um, you know, bleak. There wasn't much going on. It wasn't an exciting booth, just kind of two guys standing there. And it says contract manufacturer or something along those lines. So I walk up and I introduce myself and it ended up being um, Matt Titlow and his, <laughs> uh, his partner at the time. And so I just start talking with Matt and I'm like, hey, Matt, this is what I want to do. Um, and me and Matt ended up just going back and forth. And I think, you know, Matt can attest to um, my product knowledge at that time of, you know, just kind of telling him my ideas of what I'm trying to do and the ingredients I'd like to make or um, use in the products that I'd like to make. And it, that was actually my first run. Um, Compound Solutions, you know, manufactured our first product. And this was actually back when they were a manufacturer. Shortly after that, um, Matt made the decision to quit doing manufacturing and focus on uh, ingredient supply, which clearly, as we can see now, was an amazing decision. Absolutely. Uh, he made that, you know, a correct decision in that regard. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I started. And that's kind of how I got my foot in the door. And luckily, you know, it was with somebody that, um, you know, is trustworthy and Mm -hmm. we knew that, you know, what we're putting in our products is, 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 is what's in the product. So I'm definitely thankful that I quote unquote stumbled across, you know, someone like Matt and compound solutions. And that's where I got my start versus who knows, you know, who else I could have ended up having be my first manufacturer. Exactly. What year was this? 2014, 2015 time? um earlier than that yeah no no yeah probably around 2013 i would say so we actually started performax um and i was still working at that nutrition shop just because as most startups it's not paying my bills right Um, and then it wasn't until around 2014 that i was able to actually quit go all in um, and by this, my second product, uh, Alpha Max, we were already fully open label, full disclosure. That was just the new um, way that we were going to do it. And that's a little bit ahead of the trend. I mean, obviously, people like Nutribio were probably doing it before that. But if you were on the forums, if you were looking at, you know, the popular websites back then, like NutriPlanet and Bodybuilding.com, um, the, op- the full open labels were few and far between. And that was one of the things that we were really focused on is moving in that direction. Um, Another thing that I think, you know, we were kind of one of the first to do was the combination of real clinical dose performance and pump ingredients, Mm -hmm. but also maybe a little bit more of an edgy stim. And I feel like those were two completely separate uh, and like fields at that point. You were either like full clinical dose you know, five grams creatine at the time, you know, three grams beta alanine, 200, 250 caffeine, you know, whatever. And then on this side, there was like, okay, well, I'm a pixie dust everything, but there's one three in it. So you're going to feel it. Yeah. You got the crack powder or you got the efficacious stuff. It was either. So for us, we were, you know, I'd like to think um, one of the first to really start to do both. And, you know, we never dabbled in 1.3, but we did use Amp Citrate. So, you know, we had a full, pretty much a full disclosed label, you know, clinical dosages, but we're also using Amp Citrate. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we definitely kind of mended that. Now, as we've grown, we've, we've kept with that to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. But, you know, as any supplement scales, a supplement company scales, um, you become more of a target. And so, you know, now we, we have to make sure that everything we're doing is as compliant as possible. Um, and we're kind of, you know operating that as, as clean as we could. Mm-hmm. Now, was that the, the original version of Hypermax contained amp citrate in it? I honestly don't know. Um, I believe, I believe so. I believe the first one did. Um, but over the years, there's been so many renditions of Hypermax. I think probably like upwards of like six or more yeah. that it's really hard for me to know, but I believe, I believe it, it probably was, um, Amp Citrate was probably in the first version. And very quickly, we removed it. 
you know, we, yeah. we were probably only in the product for five or six months, and they were like, oh, bad idea. Yeah, and, it went out really quickly. Early 2015, late 2015 is when it got the uh, the ban. I think so. Yeah, somewhere right around there. Yeah. So, yep. In keeping with that, there's a couple of things I want to go from what you were just talking about. You said that when you were with the nutrition shop, you learned very quickly the differences between what the the consumer wanted and what the supplement companies themselves were trying to do, and even what the stores. Uh, what they're pushing angle is. So what were some of the things you learned in that that a consumer doesn't understand, both from the, the formulator point of view and from the supplement shop point of view? Um, that's a tough question because there's a lot. And I think that um, I think a lot of people walking into a shop, and this is why we designed our, our brand the way we did, a lot of people walking in the shop just doesn't don't know mm -hmm. and don't know what, you know, what they're supposed to take. And and, you know, kind of on a tangent, I think that's why retail should always probably will always be around is there's going to be a subset of people that can't go online and just go, yep, this is the one because mm -hmm. they just don't know. They can't turn the bottle around and look and say this is great, but they need to go in and, and, and talk with somebody. Right. Um, so that kind of, you know, guided where we position our brand, which was our brand is for the educated consumer, our mm -hmm. brand for the people that you find on bodybuilding.com forums at the time, Anabolic Minds at the time. It yeah. wasn't for the person that walked right into a store, just because the person behind the counter is not gonna be able to really give it the value it deserves. Right. Um, oh yeah, this one hits super hard, try this one. And there's, <laughs> there's just so much more going into a, a, a well-formulated product than right. you know a few strong adjectives. Um, so that's why we kind of positioned the brand the way we did. But yeah, I, I think that, um, I think that a lot of consumers, you know, going into the stores are just uneducated on on what um, they're actually looking for and what they need. And then I think that positions, you know, some of the wrong shop owners to then just push on the highest margin product. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's just how a lot of nutrition stores operate is is based on margin. At the end of the day, it's a business. So they want to be able to make the most money that they can. Um, and so... That was something that I always disagreed with, and it was something that was very difficult for me to continue to work there because mm -hmm. I was pushing, you know, I'm, I'm kind of pushing back like, hey, maybe we shouldn't be selling crealkaline. Maybe we should just give them some creatine monohydrate. You know what I mean? They're like, no, no, I can't. You know, creatine monohydrate, that's a kilo is like five bucks from Diamond Ties. Like, I can't make any money off that. Sell them the $50 cre uh, crealkaline capsules. I'm like, ah, all right, sure, whatever. You know what I mean? It was like those types of situations where... I just, you know, I just didn't, it didn't jive with what, you know, I was about coming from the mm -hmm. background of, you know, the forums uh, right. at that point in time. Yeah. Uh, the, the original company that you started, that you got your foot in the door with at the company, I, I'm not going to ask you to divulge who it was or anything like that. Uh, you said several people moved on since that time from that company. Are they still around? Um, uh, clarify what you mean. Are they still in business selling products? Currently. Oh, 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 yes. Yes, yeah. they are not on the not on the front line of of what you would, you know, like it's not anybody relevant. Yeah. In, in my opinion, they were definitely relevant back then, you right. know, they, on the forums. They were a hardcore, you know, um, they, they were a good company. Uh, yeah. I think they made some wrong moves. I think they maybe um, put too much. A value in exactly what the formulator said without doing their own due diligence, because at the end of the day, gotcha. it's them that that's their you know butts on the line, so to speak. It's not the formulator. Yeah. Um, so I think they got themselves you know into hot water, so to speak. But they didn't they didn't fold or anything. I think they just um, kind of uh, pivoted and and changed the course. And yeah, they, they're still around. They're still kicking. Okay, cool. All right, uh, moving forward to the edgy side of the products that y'all had amp citrate and y'all, you know, moved on quickly from that, but y'all still, if there's one ingredient that I find synonymous with performance more than anything else, it's Aria Gerensis. You guys have used that in, a, you know, in several products in the line and you, I think you more than any other brand have dialed in the dosing on it, right. And gotten the most out of that euphoric inducing ingredient than just about any other company. Uh, how did you stumble on the ingredient and what has been the design philosophy with incorporating it and continuing to use it going forward? Um, stumbling across it, I don't, I don't know if that's the right word. There was a lot of uh, uh, research that went into 
um, that specific ingredient. And there was a few companies that we all came out with it near the same mm-hmm. exact time. I definitely can't say that I was the first, uh, yeah. but it was, it was all kind of right around the same period of time. Um, and I believe it was us, Gaspari, and Giant Sports mm-hmm. uh, were all the ones that kind of started using N-phenethyldimethylamine, um, you know, in the beginning period. So, I mean, we've been using, you know, that ingredient for several years now. Um, and like you said, it's just been a lot of trial and error. It's been a lot of, of you know, co-administration with other phenylethylamines, seeing if there's, you know, some competitive inhibition of MOAV, um, other, you know, competitive inhibitors of MOAV, like m methylpyramine hortonine, um, mm-hmm. specific dosages there. Um, so it's, it has been just a lot of trial and error. But when we've stuck with that ingredient and um, dialed it in, like you mm-hmm. said, I think we've been able to make the most use of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know that, um, like I said, that we quote unquote discovered it, but there was a few companies that all brought it out pretty much all at the same time. Yeah. Now, the half I have a feeling half the people that are listening to this will understand all the acronyms and, and phrases you just dropped in there and half of them aren't. So can you go through and explain for them what MAOB means and what uh, just break down a little bit of what beta PEA and Aurea Orensis do? Yeah, so I mean, phenylethylamine is a, they call it the love drug. It's naturally occurring, you know, in the human body, and it's also naturally occurring in um, chocolate. So mm-hmm. supposedly, when you eat chocolate, it's what gives you that really good euphoric um, type happiness. <laughs> um, right. It's also, you know, when you quote unquote fall in love, that feeling that you get of, oh, wow, um, I'm in love. That's, that is attributed mostly to phenylethylamine or beta phenylethylamine. Um, beta phenylethylamine is quickly metabolized by MAOB, uh, monoamine oxidase B, um, and maybe A a little bit too. I'm not sure. You could probably correct me on that one. Mm-hmm. Um, but B is definitely the one that yeah, it's primarily are, B. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and so that effect generally lasts around 15, maybe 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of stimulants. Uh, throughout the years have been based on phenylethylamines and um, different variations thereof. And so N-phenethyldimethylamine is just that much more resistant to being broken down by MAO. Um, And then there's also other competitive inhibitors of MAO, basically meaning that they, um, you quote unquote, use up MAO so that there's actually, you know, less to metabolize uh, phenylethylamine and N-phenethyldimethylamine. Um, so that was kind of the premise around what we were trying to do and the co-administration of beta phenylethylamine with it, as well as using hortonine alongside of it, just to extend the effects and um, have the n phenethylamethylamine last a little bit longer um, in, uh, you know, in the feeling of it. Um, and then, of course, you know, having phenylethylamine by itself, just beta phenylethylamine, it hits, you know, you feel it quick. And so you kind of get this well, wow, I really feel it. And then n phenethylamine kind of picks up right where beta phenethylamine would kind of drop off. And then hortonine allows it to stay active for a longer period of time. Perfect. Now with going with the uh, MAOB inhibitors, a lot of, you know, y'all use uh, hortonine or, you know, a barley extract that's standardized for for Mm -hmm. hortonine. Uh, And the typical dose that we'll see in supplements is anywhere between, you know, 50 to 75 milligrams. The average is most of the time it's 50 milligrams. But the the thing I'm finding curious is that there there haven't been a whole lot of studies in humans using hortonine. So how did y'all arrive at that being kind of the ideal dose? Is it just trial and error? Like you you mixed in 10 milligrams and you just kind of try titrate in the dose until you find something that's a sweet spot, or how does that go? I think that I think that plays into a ton of ingredients. Um, yeah, especially in the stimulant side of things. Yeah, where we all we would all love for you know perfect. Um, dosages to be established for us. I mean, my God, think about how much easier formulation would be. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh yeah, that's perfect for that. Okay, boom, my product's done. So yeah, it's exactly it's exactly what you said. It just comes down to um, trial and error and just playing with it. And I think that is the you know the key point there is, you know, companies that jump from stimulant to stimulant or, oh, Pancentric got banned, let me put in this. Oh, that one got banned, let me put in this. That got banned, let me put in. And it's like, okay, well, you're never really figuring that ingredient out and the way to optimize it the best. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that we've done really well. And like you said, um, you know, we've stuck with that ingredient for quite a while. And I feel like we've gone to a point where 
we really understand uh, the feeling of it and what we need to do to uh, to optimize that feeling of it. So, but yeah, simplistically, the answer would be yeah, it's a lot and a lot of trial and error. Um, for myself is where it starts, and then you know we start branching it out to larger testing groups and then larger testing groups mm -hmm. um, until we can start to get a consensus among the groups that okay, this is this is uh this is what we need to go with. Excellent. Can you walk? Uh, the listeners through your thought process when you're formulating a product and how you go about from the initial inception of what the concept of the product is going to be uh, until you maybe find your first group of beta testers. So how do you go about, you know, formulating the stimulant blend for a product and what, what are the steps that you take to involve with that to bring it? And then you decide, you decide personally, I like this. And then you give it to some people to try out what kind of goes through that. So I think that's interesting. And, and I'll, I'll start with how I was taught to formulate from the formulator from that uh, original uh, mm -hmm. company I worked with. And their formulation process was find one really effective ingredient. So just base the whole entire formulation on one ingredient that works really well. And now build a formula around that ingredient mm -hmm. to then optimize that ingredient and, and have some sort of synergism along with that ingredient. Um, and well, I think that's great. I do think that probably comes more from a cost perspective than a effectiveness perspective. If they could really put, you know, 80%, 70% of the, the cost of that product into one ingredient, then, okay, well, all I need to do is find three or four real supporting ingredients that have some, you know, some synergism on paper and, um, and then boom, we're done. We have our product. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do at Performax is, we're combining a lot of powerhouse style ingredients um, together that have a multitude of different effects. And the way that starts is each individually. So we don't just start throwing stuff together and go, you know what, on paper, this would make sense. No, we start with one, and then we add to it, then we add to it. And then we add, it's like, so example, like start, you know, starting when we were messing around with dynamine, we just take dynamine by itself and we take a little bit more by itself. Then we yeah. can add in, you know, a little bit of caffeine. And uh, we just kind of move in, in that kind of scenario where we're adding to the formula so that we can eliminate as many variables as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens is a lot of people formulate on paper first, and then they go and, you know, either have their contract manufacturer or we actually, you know, for us personally, we actually have a, a lab in our office where we make a, all samples ourselves. So yeah. I've nailed down, you know, we, we stock all ingredients. We have our contract manufacturer actually send us all the flavors they stock. We'll do everything in-house in our lab. And then once we've gone to the end product, well, then I, I know for a fact when my contract manufacturer makes their sample, theoretically, it should match perfect to my sample because we're all using the same raw materials. Right. And then we we move on that way. So, yeah, the, the formulation process is really tedious. And it's one where we're trying to eliminate, you know, as many variables as possible. So we certainly don't um, take a product or a formulation on paper, put it into sampling, and then make tweaks from there. We build it kind of one ingredient at a time. And, you know, that is probably more towards, you know, the, uh, the stimulant side of things. Mm -hmm. Some things are just, you know, like, we don't need to do a whole bunch of testing on a dosage of creatine. Like, we, we got it. We, yeah, you know, that citrulline, so, you kind of know the, the proven players in the yeah, game. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, in that sense where there's not going to be a, 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 an incredibly acute uh, effect and there is a lot of science behind it, we can just go with what we know works. Um, but when it comes down to ingredients that you feel um, or that have more of an acute effect, then we definitely try and um, start – you know, start small, start as a single ingredient, and then kind of build from there. Um, and then once it gets to a point that I'm happy with it, and maybe a few of the guys in the office are happy with it, mm -hmm. then we'll start, you know, finding larger and larger groups and actually, um, uh, you know, having them test it and then moving on to that, uh, to that second stage yeah. where we'll have, you know, like we have an online rep team of five people We'll have to send it to them. We'll find other people on the forums or uh, other people in the gym. We'll just get, uh, you know, as much feedback as possible. Now, it's funny because it's actually, this might not even sound great, but it's maybe even less methodical now mm -hmm. than it was when we first started. When, we, when I first started, 
I would blend up anything. I just didn't. <laughs> I just. I just don't know if it's gonna homogenize perfect. Yeah. So I'm just not gonna do that. I literally weighed out every single ingredient in a formula one by one, and I would either put it in a little baggie or I put it in like one of those little pill jars. Yeah. And that way, I knew for a fact what is in there is exactly what I want to be in there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we wouldn't even allow for you know small scale blends or anything back then. Um, now you know with tabletop V blenders and things that we have access to, I feel quite a bit better about uh, you know um, sampling that way. Right. But when we first started, every single ingredient was individually weighed by myself and then added to you know a container one by one, and I literally had a checklist. Okay, that's in there, that's in there, that's in there, until we got to a point where the whole entire formula and it's so freaking tedious. It yeah. was I really didn't like doing it, but I just didn't see any other way to do it. Then on top of that, they were then handed, you know, a few samples and like a three page uh, document that they had to fill out, like mm -hmm. down to the T. Because getting people, getting real feedback from people is difficult. It's, oh, yeah. You know, like, how, how, you energy, like, endless pumps. Yeah, it'll be yeah, something. Like that. Oh, yeah, it was, it was good. It was good. Yeah, yeah, it was good. I, no, I was real focused. Yeah, I felt that for sure. And got the tingles. Yeah. It's like, yeah. what? what? It's like, uh, <laughs> all right. That doesn't, you know, so um back then it was real real tedious in how we collect that collected that information and like i said it, you know we're not to that degree now mm -hmm. and part of that is is because i have a little bit more trust in the process now and i don't need to put out ingredients you know one by one but that's like how we started that's how um you know uh, important we thought formulation was at that point and that's the backbone of our brand i mean we're not a marketing powerhouse <laughs> by any means right like you guys used to call us the most underrated brand in the industry or whatever the thing was, which, yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. appreciate it, but um, <laughs> I, I knew. I knew to be an underhanded or a backhanded compliment yeah, or something exactly. like that. I, I, knew, I, knew what, I knew what you meant, but I'm like, you probably, <laughs> you probably could have just left that out. Um, yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, and, and that's the thing is we're not, you know, a, a, a massive, huge player with, you know, tons of money and investors and, you know, putting at hundreds of thousands in the Facebook ads and things like that. Yeah. We're from from inception been completely 100 percent focused on putting out the best product in each individual category. And that's where we nail it. I mean, it's just, you know, maybe it's not flavors, but it's everything else. <laughs> yeah, well, flavors are coming along. They've come along a long way in the uh, in the two years or so that I've known you. So from from the, the previous couple iterations of what Hypermax is to today, it's far, far better. So yeah. I mean, that, that much I can attest to. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of things. First of all, I think there's so the, the brand name is Performax Labs, and you mentioned that you actually have a lab on site in your facility. I think most of the listeners would be surprised to learn that if a company has labs in their name, nine times out of ten, they don't actually have a lab on site where they're actually doing anything. It's just the catchy name that they're doing to try and catch your attention. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. I mean, how many labs were there back in, you know, 2005. The only one I could think of is USP Labs. It was just yeah. USP Labs. That was it. And everyone else was nutrition or, um, you know, whatever. Sports uh, or something like that. Yeah. Sports, yeah, exactly. Nutraceuticals, um, nutritionals, whatever was the the that 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 second uh, that second word. But yeah, there was almost no labs. Now, um, you know, everybody is a labs. It's just super super easy to. Uh, you know, kind of uh, add that on. And now you have a, a, a company name. And I mean, even for us, like I was dumbfounded when I found out that there was no company or anything that had Performax. It just made perfect sense to me. Yeah. You know, and I, and I bought that name and that domain back in 2011 before we did it, like before we did it, like years before we actually made anything. Mm -hmm. I was like, I, uh, you know, this is going to happen. I don't know when, but this is like what I'd like to do with yeah. my life. And I'm just kind of tossing around names, like Performax, like that makes perfect sense. These are yeah. you know, things to help enhance your performance and who doesn't want to maximize that. And so, yeah, we went with that name and, and uh, tossing labs on the end of it <laughs> worked out. So excellent. Uh, yeah. Um, how long does it take, I guess, timeline wise, where you start with your uh, microdosing and, and titrating of the ingredients and figuring out what kind of a blend works well for you to when the product actually hits the market? And I realize it's going to vary depending on the complexity of the product. Um, but what's a rough timeline? Six months out? Eight months? A year? 
Uh, it like you said, it really, really depends. Um, Iamino Max uh, mm-hmm. was uh, quite a bit quicker. You know, mm-hmm. uh, that was just you know making sure that we can nail the flavor. Um, definitely doing you know some testing, but that's again you know when you're trying to get people's feedback on a product that doesn't have an, an, you know incredibly acute effects. Right. Yeah, it, it tasted good, and you know I started recovering better. So what we what what we did with that one was yeah it was a much shorter time period. Mm-hmm. Um, any of our stimulant based products take a long time. I mean six months would be far short. It would probably be much closer to a year of testing. Um, and that's not to say, you know, 365 days, every single day, we're doing something different, right. but in, in the, in the realm of running a business, um, getting things, you know, uh, put together, finding the formulation, testing the formulation, getting users feedback, making the adjustments time after time, after time, after time. until you get to the final thing. Then once you have the final formulation, making sure you can source all the, the right materials, making sure that materials are tested, everything works out perfect. We have the flavors that we need to do, mm-hmm. and then we can go into production it, yeah, it can definitely be, you know, a, a year's time easily. Interesting, interesting. What is, and through your course of self-experimentation and whatnot, what is it, one ingredient, or it could be one or two, that you think is a little bit uh, overhyped in the industry from either a, a stimulatory experience or performance? Um, huh. I don't know, because I feel like I'm going to piss off someone that has... <laughs> <laughs> uh shoot um i couldn't tell you one i mean they're all it's just going to be all the ones that you know uh i think we all know just don't do anything like you know if we're if 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 you want a real easy answer it's going to be things like arginine and and somehow it keeps making it back into people's in people's products and god knows how um they somehow some someone keeps using it and I've even seen kind of like major players, you know, in the industry, you know, and I'm not saying like legacy brands. I'm saying like major players on the come up. Um, yeah. They're still using AAKG and all exactly. other forms it's of, of garbage. Using, I'm just like, what, how did you not? How did you not get the memo? You know what I mean? Like, where, <laughs> where did, where, where did that make sense? Like, you know, and it could be, oh, well, it's a cheap ingredient. Well, just fucking leave it out. You know, yeah. just don't use it cheap. Just don't use it then. That's cheaper. You yeah. know. Um, so definitely that's one of them that, like I said, I'm, I said, I'm surprised that I still see, um, if I had to pick a second one, huh? Um, to be honest, I don't know. I couldn't, I mean, I'm sure you could throw out a few and, and we probably agree on them, but I would say right now, um, just off the top of my head, the one that I just am dumbfounded that we keep seeing is, is arginine. What about some of the, uh, the so-called fat burner ingredients like, uh, Octopamine, halostation, or hygienamine, any of those kind of beta 2 agonists. Do you think any of those are better than, say, hordenine or synephrine, or are they just kind of meh? Um, I do think they're, yeah, that's hard too. From a pure fat burning perspective, I think they're kind of meh. Mm-hmm. I do think that there is um, some synergism where if done correctly, um, it can it can definitely have an effect. Um, you know, like for Oxymax, you know, we have a combination of, you know, uh, Forslin that increases uh, um, Sicilic AMP, and then we have alpha uh with Hygienamine, and th- that three combination all kind of works down the same pathway downstream mm-hmm. to enhance fat loss. So I think, and this is, you know, theoretical, right? Like we haven't, we haven't actually done the clinical study uh, yeah. to to prove that, but theoretically, those three ingredients uh, all work through the same you know stream of of mechanism right. to enhance fat loss. So I think in that sense, um, I think you know there there could be some value in them. Um, so hygienamine of the ones you mentioned would be the one that maybe I would like give a nod to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the like the other ones, octopamine, halostatin. Halostat, I don't even know how Halostatin even became a stimulant. I've, I, yeah. I've never used it. I, it's been in a blend with, you know, 14 other stimulants. So it's it's kind of hard to say, man, that that, that Halostatin really felt good. I mean, that just took it over the edge. It, it, yeah, exactly. So one, and it's one ingredient I haven't done a lot of research into because my initial, you know, findings, like, okay, this, had, this, this isn't actually a stimulant at all. Yeah. Um, 
and and I don't know that there's any real solid you know fat burning mechanism behind it and just boom chalk you know thrown to the side so mm-hmm. that's like how how far my research went into that one so I really couldn't go too deep into that into that for you mm-hmm. but I do think you know something like hygienamine could be effective I also know that I forget what company it was shoot this was quite a while quite a long time ago um that was doing massive they they never actually made it to market they were mm-hmm. just some 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 in-house testing and they were doing massive doses of hygienamine like you know 100 milligrams 150 milligrams 200 milligrams oh, and wow. they were reporting i feel like it was giant sports but i could be wrong and again i don't want to you know like upset anybody but i yeah. feel like well i feel like it was but i could be completely wrong mm-hmm. but i remember a, a company doing some some testing with some massive doses of hygienamine and they were reporting some really strong some really strong effects from it so yeah i i personally haven't tried that so i don't know yeah the most i've I've seen in a product i want to say is probably 75 milligrams and i think one of the older versions of uh blackstone's dust or dust extreme had it back then but they've gone through several reformulations so i'm not even sure if the doses have that high anymore yeah yeah no I, i i do remember that one i think that was the one that um the gorilla chemist did yeah yeah um, now y'all have used alpha yohimbine or, uh, Rowalskine in most of the, uh, the stimulant blends, or that's your defer, that's your preferred form of yohimbine. What made you choose that over regular, you know, yohimbine hydrochloride? Is it personal preference on the feel or is it, you know, some kind of underlying mechanism that the people listening may not be aware of? It, it is personal. So this, this is a weird, kind of a weird, uh, situation. So when Alpha Yohimbine came out, I can't remember. I, I believe his forum name was Desaid, and I could I could be completely wrong if that was the person. I think it was Matt. It might be somebody else. But anyway, the point is, is when Alpha Yohimbine came out, it came mm-hmm. out in a uh, thirty. Per, I think it was a was it? A, I think it was a thirty percent extract, mm-hmm. and th- I believe it was thirty milligrams, and it yielded nine milligrams alpha yo along alongside black pepper extract right holy hell well that's where things get a little odd for a long time alpha yohimbine was always touted as a more a more tolerable version of yohimbine if you Mm -hmm. go back and you look you know three four five years ago on the forums everybody yep alpha yohimbine i i can deal with alpha yohimbine it's that the yohimbine hcl that just gives me the jitters and uneasiness and 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 that whole and that whole um you know negative side effects that people get from that don't respond to yohimbine so for a long time alpha yohimbine was the one that people actually were able to take when they couldn't take you know yohimbine uh, hydrochloride and again that was you know uh kind of backed up by the fact that one of the first products that came out with real extracted alpha yohimbine um was at a nine milligram dose and mm-hmm. people rated it perfectly well um nowadays i don't know if it's because more synthetic versions of alpha yohimbine are being used or it's a slightly different isomer uh, i don't know but it seems like nowadays alpha yohimbine is associated with less tolerability than yohimbine hydrochloride um so we've used Yohim, alpha yohimbine for for a long time mm-hmm. and we've always found that it's more tolerable than um than normal yohimbine hcl uh mm-hmm. and that's why we've always used it and we continue to use it that way and, and most people seem to enjoy it in our products um however there are you know products too that you know it seems to hit people hard so it could be the formulation it could be you know whether you know because i do know that there's a rosslyn uh hydrochloride available i do know it, it, it is you know there's a synthetic version available it could be that it could be a number of things i don't know but we chose to use it because at a point in time it's more tolerable and mm-hmm. i still believe it to be uh, a more tolerable uh, ingredient than johann hydrochloride i would agree with that in the, the products the performance products i've used that have it in there i've never experienced an adverse reaction to that ingredient I, I want to say it's either the the grade of extract or the quality of extract y'all are using or the dosage because I've tried I tend to respond better to regular yohimbine hydrochloride. I've gone up to five or seven milligrams and been fine on on your regular yohimbine. But it's 
when that when the alpha Y gets to I want to say four milligrams and above that five that four to five alpha Y doses, yeah. man, I feel in a way that I've never felt before, and it's the most uncomfortable, nasty feeling I've ever imagined. So it's I think while that stimulant is indeed very powerful, it at the right dose it can be incredibly smooth and make for a good energy experience. But you cross that threshold, man, and it goes off a cliff real, really quickly. Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. It's it's one where um, let one of those ingredients where less is better. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. What um now you I you know I can I can, I've, I've met your wife, talked to her before in the past. Has she been with you since the inception of Performax? Kind of, I believe mm-hmm. so. Like, no, obviously not from a uh, formulation perspective, right? And not from a, uh, not from like an inception perspective, but from receiving the first, you know, pallet or a couple pallets of product, yes. Yeah, and so That's- she's yeah, she's been there, you know, ever since. Um, there was a certain point in time where, you know, obviously. Um, there wasn't enough revenue being generated to really have any employees. Right. Um, she was still helping. And yeah. that, and you know, within the last, you know, three years, she's exclusively worked for um, Performax as our office administrator and bookkeeper. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah, like to your, to your question. Yes. She's been there ever since we got our very first uh, pallets of product. Yeah. The reason I was asking is that, you know, Sandy played a, a pivotal role or, you know, a, a strong driving force in me switching into this industry. And I spoke recently with Justin Hall, the, the founder of Supplement Snoop app. And he said his wife was kind of that driving force behind him that kept giving him the encouragement to say, yeah, you can do this, you can do this. And, you know, when you encounter challenges, they're kind of there to be that reinforcement that, hey, you're doing the right thing. So I didn't know if you had similar experiences by that, or if you don't want to even go into that, we can just shift topic and go into something else entirely. So I think... And we talked about this a little bit before we got, uh, you know, on the actual, the interview was, I got into this for the formulation side of it, right? And so um, that's where my focus has always been. And lo and behold, there's this actual whole other side called the business uh, that needs to get ran too. And so that's taken up so much more of my time that I haven't been able to dedicate as much time to the science and formulation as, as I'd like, because that's really the core of, of what I enjoy to do. Um, so with that in mind, having you know my wife on board has allowed me to dedicate more time to do that mm-hmm. uh, because she can take uh, a little bit of burden off of me in terms of you know, running our QuickBooks and, um, you know, international shipments, having to do our SLIs and our commercial invoices and, and things like the, the real the monotony of the day-to-day style mm-hmm. business things. Um, yeah. She's kind of taken the bull by the horns. And so that frees up a little bit of my time to focus on, you know, what I feel I'm good at, which is coming out with, you know, really, really good product. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that sense, yeah, it's definitely been an integral role to get where we are today. And it's, it's kind of like a team effort, you know, where we, we both have the roles that we're able to play it and, and we be, we both benefit from those. Yeah. What's been a couple of the, the big hurdles that you've had to uh, surmount when building up for Formax? Hmm. Um, your, your interview so far is very introspective. You're making me think a lot about it. <laughs> That's <laughs> the goal. I try to, I try to, I try to get past the surface fluff of, hey, you know, pimp your products, which yeah, there will be, time, there'll be time to do that. Trust me. I so. just don't, I just don't think about these things, I guess. Um, hurdles, definitely just like in general, just the marketing, right. Just like not getting the, 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 the nod that I think our formulations deserve, not getting the, the focus that I think our products, um, should get. And I think, um, it's, it's not sad. It's just the way that the industry is moving. I mean, yeah. Look, look at all the products on the market nowadays, now that there's been the push, you know, which we we were happy to be a part of, the push towards, you know, fully disclosed open label products. Yeah. Well, what, what do you know now? All products start to look the same, you mm-hmm. know, and people want to go, oh, well, you know, you know, they're not copying or, you know, you know, even if it was a prop blend, they could uh, they could test your product and find out really, though. I mean, does some does another company really want to just arbitrarily spend thousands and thousands of dollars just to find out what's in your product? Um, 
So I just, yeah, I just think that, you know, I just think that everything is starting to look a little bit more and more similar. Um, so, you know, now that goes back to, okay, well, if everything's starting to look more and more similar, then what's the differentiation factor? And that's the marketing. And that's something that we haven't, you know, done a lot of because we've been focused on producing the best products on the market. So I think that's probably the major hurdle that we have is, is that nowadays it's really about the marketing nowadays where products are all starting to look a little bit more similar and they're starting, all the formulations are starting to be a bit more similar and they're easy to be similar because they're all open label. So yeah. the next guy, the next, the next guy that wants to come out with a good product you know, just, okay, well, it's going to have six grams of citrulline, you know, it's going to have 300 milligrams of caffeine. It'll for sure have a gram of agmatine. I guarantee it. You yeah. know, my gram of tyrosine, like I could, we could do this all day, you know? Right. And so then now that there's less differentiation, well then how, how do you set yourself apart? Well, it's just gonna be, what kind of lifestyle and culture you can formulate. Yeah, around. Exa exactly. So it's just going to be the marketing behind it. So I think that's been our, our major hurdle. I do think you know, there are ways that we can differentiate ourselves. Uh, I think we're, we're the only company to use s nitrosoglutathione, um, which is a um, nitric oxide donor. Um, I, you know, we were one of the first to use um, uh, Eriodrensis, as we spoke about. Um, so we try and differentiate ourselves through the ingredients that we use. And um, it is becoming more difficult uh, because, you know, now everyone has access to the same stuff and it's easy to know what works. Oh, well, it's in that product. That's a popular product. I can go ahead and add that to my product as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, I think the major hurdle for us has always just been, we've always wanted to focus on the formulations. We've always wanted to focus on putting out the best product. Nowadays, that's just not enough. Mm -hmm. We need to do the, the more of the marketing. So if since formulations kind of been, you know, your baby, the stuff that you like to enjoy the most, and I'm an, an unabashed ingredient nerd myself. So I, I share your passion for just wanting to focus on formulation and not want to have to mess with all the other, you know, fluff and frivolity of the supplement industry. What are some of the emerging ingredients that have you excited as a formulator? Um, see, and that, that goes back to, you know, what we're, what we're talking about is that I probably haven't been able to dive deep enough into that aspect mm -hmm. yet to really, um, you know, get excited about stuff. I know I, me and you were, you know, texting each other a couple of days ago and I told you about that new nitro rocket. Yeah. Uh, I think that could be a really cool ingredient. Um, I've, I, one of my buddies, uh, Marcus, which I, you know, yep. um, he, he was able to try it and he said it, it was, it was strong. And so now we've got to figure out like, well, well, why, you know what? Because the amount of, of, um, nitrates contained in there yeah. isn't at all, isn't at all close to what you would get from an amino acid nitrate or a mm -hmm. potassium sodium nitrate, but he was getting lightheaded at a very low dose. So then, so then you start to think, oh. okay, well, you know, are there other, you know, antioxidants, polyphenols, things like that, that are making it those nitrates that much more effective. Yeah. Because we all, we all know that, you know, if you're going to use a, a, an amino acid nitrate or a, a, a sodium potassium nitrate, it needs to be, um, you know, co-administered with vitamin C, an antioxidant, to try and eliminate as many, you know, cancer-causing, you know, agents as possible. But at the same time, that would lead to a higher conversion to actual nitric oxide. Right. So if it's in a source that is riddled with a ton of antioxidants, and um, polyphenols and things like that, does it make a lower dose that much more effective? Possibly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be my only kind of uh, um, understanding or, or reasoning to why it felt so strong for him. So I think that's an exciting ingredient, you know, whether it's going to be able to be used due to, you know, um, the limits on patents and things like that. I don't know. Um, but it sounds like a pretty... Uh, interesting ingredient being able to standardize up to 10 percent nitrate when the highest beetroot on the market is like two percent that yeah. seems pretty cool um who knows if it's actually going to make it to market um but that one i thought was pretty cool just getting you know a little bit of user feedback from it mm -hmm. um other than that uh, there's probably not like i said I, I probably haven't dived deep enough into what's coming out to really give you kind of an exciting uh 
uh, feedback on on upcoming ingredients. I'm sure I'm sure once we get off the podcast, they're like, oh yeah, there's that one and that one. <laughs> like, well, let's talk about some of the uh, since you've got a you know a common history with Matt over at Compound, and you know I, I spoke to him a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about it just a little while ago as well. Um, what do you think about some of their newer offerings like uh, Vaso Six, Dynamine, and you know Next CBD? That's kind of those are three of the hot ones it seems right now on the market from a formulation standpoint. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, we're playing with all three. Um, so yeah, I think I think Vaso Six is a is a really cool ingredient. Um, I definitely uh, we use it in Vaso Max. Uh, mm-hmm. And we did at a certain point, you know, have a, a license to use potassium nitrate. And uh, we switched from potassium nitrate to Vaso 6, and we actually got better reviews. There was actually people that were saying, wow, I actually like this version better. Mm-hmm. So obviously, as I'm sure Matt explained, um, you know, there's the uh, benefit of increased nitric oxide, but there's also the benefit of, you know, increased endothelial function, the relaxing of the, the blood vessel itself. Correct. And I think that one or two, that one, two punch um, leads to a pretty, you know, substantial, you know, pump feeling. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was a, a a really cool ingredient, and I was happy to include that in Vaso Max, and we've had a ton of really positive feedback on it. Um, I think Dynamine is a really cool ingredient. Um, I think maybe the timing or positioning wasn't quite fair, right? Like I don't think it. Sh- I don't think it should have been positioned. Not from like Matt standpoint, but I think from the consumer standpoint of like, oh, DMHA is going. What's going to be the next best thing? And it just happened to be that Dynamine was coming out at that point in time. I yeah. don't think I don't think Dynamine is a replacement for uh, DMHA. But no. do I think it could be formulated very effectively into a formulation? Absolutely. We did it with Stimmax, yeah. and we use a good dose of Dynamine, and that stuff hits hard, you mm-hmm. know. But in no way am I going to be like, oh yeah, well, you know, take it against one three, and you're going to see this stuff. <laughs> You know, you know what I mean? So yeah. I think you have to be kind of realistic when you're talking about an ingredient that's 100 percent compliant, that has grass status. Um, yeah, it might it might not be uh, able. I mean, um, I guess unless it's Bruce's new stems, it might not be able to go against uh, against a one three type product. But I think that's where formulation comes into play. And then if you go back to that, it actually pushes people to formulate better. Mm-hmm. I mean. What type of formulation do you need when you have one three? I'll tell you, it's caffeine and one three. Right. <laughs> yeah, like you have, yeah, you have those two, and then you can throw in whatever quote unquote performance enhancing ingredients you want, you know, citrulline, creatine, beta alanine, whatever. Mm-hmm. But it's in terms of a, a strong, good feeling stem, it's not very much formulation. So I do think um, it levels the playing field a little bit. And I do think it makes people have to go back to the drawing board and go, okay, well now we're going to have to really figure out some good synergism. We're really going to have to, you know, play with these dosages and these ingredients and find out how can we get to a, a close, a close feeling um, while trying to stay compliant. And I think, you know, one that we really worked hard on was Nootropamax. And mm-hmm. I know that you and, and Mike at the time, you know, thought it was the closest thing that felt, you know, you guys felt to one three that wasn't. Yeah. And that's probably like the fuck the freaking dream, right? Like that yeah. would be what that would be like what anybody formulating a product would want. Hey, this is hundred percent compliant, you know, to, to a certain degree. Um, there's no one three, there's no DMHA, there's no dodgy stems, yet it feels like a one three type product. I mean, what better effect could you get? Yeah. Uh, so I like I said, I think dynamine's a great ingredient. Um, and I think it's it definitely has a ton of value. Uh, maybe the timing wasn't perfect in terms of, you know, the consumer feeling like it should replace, you know, DMHA. And I, and that's just not fair, but I think it's an amazing ingredient. And I think, you know, formulated properly into a product, it will really take that product up a notch. Mm -hmm. Uh, CBD. uh, I mean, I just, I I just think there's too much, you know, too much uh, risk involved in really marketing and putting on the market a CBD product. Now, yeah. Next Hemp as a natural hemp extract mm-hmm. should theoretically be Daisha compliant. Now, right. there are people that disagree because as a hemp extract, it could still and still does theoretically contain some CBD. So right. then CBD is 
um, categorized as a drug, you know, once pharmaceuticals or uh, pharmaceutical patented and, and start selling it, um, even though hemp should be able to be sold as and is able to be sold as a, uh, you know, natural extract, if it does contain that one constituent, it could pose some trouble even just for, you know, a hemp extract. I mean, look at red yeast rice, right? Like, Red yeast rice is fine until you have lovastatin in it, you know, and then, oh, well, now it's, now it's a drug and now you have an adulterated supplement. Well, not, no, not really. I just have yet red yeast rice, like, <laughs> break, you know what I mean? So I, I could see it going that way. Uh, but like I said, we, we're doing some testing with it. We're working with compound solutions on Next Temp um, and we'll see what happens. You know, there, there is definitely a chance, and I'm actually looking at the formulation right here. Um, there is definitely a chance that, you know, a hemp extract makes it into a, a Performax product. Uh, in the future, I just think it's something where, you know, you got to kind of cross your T's, dot your I's and, and uh, um, you know, make sure that you go about it, label it and sell it uh, yeah. in the right manner. Now, on the date that we're recording this, this is towards the end of 2018. What is up in 2019 for the brand without giving too much away? We obviously know we just saw the release on Stack 3D that Hypermax Extreme is in the works. Um, yeah, Hypermax Extreme is one I'm really, really excited about. Um, I think, you know, it should be like the, you know, the top pre-workout in the market. I think the current Hypermax is up there, uh, you know, with the top pre-workouts on the market. And, you know, you mentioned Stack, and, you know, Stack clearly agrees, giving us the second best pre-workout on the market currently. Yep. So now, now my, my thoughts are, okay, well, how the heck do I become number one? Right. And so that's what we're going for with, you know, Hypermax Extreme is kind of um, upping the playing field a little bit, increasing the energy um, to a certain degree without becoming uncomfortable, increasing mm -hmm. the focus, um, even though the focus is already like the main point on Hypermax, uh, better pumps, better performance. And yeah, it's going to hit hard. You know, it's, it's definitely going to be a slap in the face, but an enjoyable one at that. Yeah. Um, so that's the next uh, product that we have coming out, I believe it should be like mid December, mm -hmm. um, just to kind of get it poised and ready for the new year and yeah. instead of kind of waiting for the new year. Um, the other ones we're working on is a protein, uh, which are obviously I can't give you too much information on, but we do have a, a protein in the works. Um, we do have a sleep, um, capsule that we are working on. Um, and a joint formula. We also have a joint. I, I think the joint formula is pretty much ready to go. Um, we have it all priced out. We have the, uh, all the um, formula. Uh, it's just a matter of like, you know, what's the best timing to put that product out when we have some really exciting releases like the protein and the new pre-workout and things like that. Now, from your experience with running the brand, is it better from, I guess, a product release standpoint to kind of stagger the releases or flood the market with you know, three or four new releases within a two month span, or is it better to kind of stagger them out, you know, do one every four months or three months or something like that? It depends on the position of the brand, mm -hmm. right? So it depends on where do you currently stand? Are you generating hype? Or are you maintaining hype? Right. Yeah. So, or not even hype, but just momentum, let's say. Yeah. So if you're a, a brand that needs to make an impact, just like we needed to make an impact last October, Right. There was just so much of, you know, oh, Performax has great products, but they're not really that relevant. You know, oh, Performax has really good formulations, but it's, you know, it's not really, they're not really out there very much. So we took, we took that whole entire month and I think we launched like four or five products, like back to back to back to back. And just to show like, look, we can put out like some really good freaking products, like pay attention. Kind yeah. of. But then from that point, you can't do that every month. I'd have a, a line of product that's a uh, hundred, hundred products deep. So, and then at that point, I think, you know, now you just need to kind of main, maintain that and, you know, come out with another one and then come out with another one. So I think, you know, like, for example, like Olympus labs is doing it really well right now where mm -hmm. they've come out with, you know, several products kind of back to back to back to back. And yeah. what it's going to do is that's just going to create that momentum moving into 2019. And then I suppose through 2019, it'll probably be, you know, once a quarter, or, you know, maybe once every eight weeks, then a new product kind of comes out to keep the interest of the consumer um, kind of coming back and wondering, okay, well, what's next? Then what's next? And that's the sad part about, you know, that's the sad part about the industry. It's that That's really what it is, is what's next? It's so like a pre-workout launches, yeah. it's hot for like two weeks, 
and then okay so okay so what's 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 the next one what's better and then right. another one comes out oh my god this is the best one okay and then then it slowly dies off and another one so that is you know um i guess one downside but you know to your question that's where those consistent releases kind of extended make more sense but you know as an upcoming brand that wants to make an impact i think you really need to kind of put your money where your mouth is and come out with some strong formulations and several of them right out the gate to get attention yeah which in the lineup in the uh, performax arsenal are you most proud of all of them all of them <laughs> Well, it's well, it's funny because I just start I, I like I literally just start to like roll through the products in my head. I'm like, well, yeah, that, that one's really good. And, nope, yeah, that one's really good too. So I, I I honestly don't I honestly couldn't give you an answer because I wholeheartedly believe we're putting out some of the best products per category. And like I'll stack my product up against any product available in that specific category. I honestly think Alpha Max is probably one of the most complete testosterone boosters. I honestly think. You know, Oxymax's capsule fat burner um, is one of the most complete, real fat burning um, products, uh, yeah. and just kind of goes down, you know, down the list of of um, in in you know of the products that we have and the ingredients that we we use. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, like Eaminomax, something that's not really that. Uh, I mean, it's not like exciting in the same way that a pre workout release would be exciting, but you know, having a full two grams of L carnitine, L tartrate. Per serving, mm -hmm. I mean, most fat burners don't even have that, or most products in general don't even. Have, you know, it's usually 500 or 1,000 milligrams, but we're going to yeah. do that because that's what the science shows. Yeah. Um, same thing with Hika. You find Hika, and Hika is generally, um, you know, dosed at like a 500 milligram uh, amount. And in our product, obviously, <laughs> for the for the people in the background, my, my wife just got home from work and she's trying to crawl underneath the camera. <laughs> What what what's what's funny is it would have probably been like way less distracting if someone just walked by, but instead <laughs> I just see this little head pop out. <laughs> Sadie, the video doesn't go online. We oh, put up a banner. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> hi. hi, say hi to Aaron. Hi. <laughs> uh, that was hilarious. But yeah, like for example, most people using Hika are using you know 500 milligrams. And um, the daily dose, the clinically proven dose is 1,500 milligrams. And I've had, like, literal discussions. I actually just had one uh, this weekend with um, someone like, yeah, man, don't you think you could just do 500 milligrams? I'm like, yeah, I, I probably could. You're like, you know, why you know, why don't you just do a gram of L-carnitine? You know you could save some money if you just did a gram of L-carnitine 500 HICA. I'm like, yeah, I know I could save some money. But at the same time, it's also not going to be clinical dosages of what's actually proven to work. And I have to stand behind that wholeheartedly, regardless of cost, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's what makes our products, um, you know, per category, some of the best in that category. Gotcha. What is your, now somebody that's running their own business, how do you juggle uh, mental sanity, still getting in your workouts and keeping the ship going the right direction? Um, I don't. <laughs> um no i mean I, I i personally think you know everybody can do it their own sort of way i know super successful people that um you know with it specifically within this industry that literally end their day at two they're just like mm -hmm. yeah I, I like because you know also comes down to like efficiency versus you know um just time i mean if, if you know people can say oh, i put in like you know i, I work 12 hours at my job today but how many were actually just scrolling through facebook or how many were like checking your phone and how many were you actually super dialed in, like on a roll, getting stuff done? Probably like 30% of the time. So if you were actually able to become incredibly efficient mm -hmm. when you did work, you probably could put in a lot less hours yeah. if you were able to kind of get in that zone. But I think, I mean, it just goes back to like kind of like society as a whole uh, right now. It's just like, it's this mentality that like it's super cool to be working all the time and you're not going to get anywhere unless you're, you're busting your butt and you're working 70 hours a week. But when you actually audit that 70 hour a week, there's probably like 30 hours where you were doing butt all anyway, you know, yeah. you're now, scrolling between Instagram, Facebook, your email, 
Yeah, yeah, and and you can ju- and you can justify it too, right? You can ju- well, what if there's an email? Let me check my email again. Okay, there's not an email. All right, well, Facebook. Oh yeah, I just I just saw this other company's coming out with this product, so you know it helps me it helps me gain consumer research on on what's going on. So it's like you can easily justify any of those things um, as work. Uh, the I guess it's really just being honest with yourself um, on you know are you actually taking a step forward or are you chalking that hour up to work now with all that said i'm not at all like that you know like that person i gave you an example of that's done it too i and yeah. I, and I don't know how you are but i'm i'm like slightly like obsessive about things and i think that's what made me you know at least i wouldn't even say good at what i do but get to where i am now with performax as a whole is that you know when i was when i was growing up and i was uh was like 13, 14, 15, something like that. I would bounce around from from different uh, hobbies, trying mm-hmm. to find something that I that I really really liked. But while I was in that hobby, I was probably like the most annoying person you could ever imagine. Like I remember my dad was like, "Could you just shut up about that stuff?" I'm like, <laughs> "Nope." I'm just like literally like it's just like a like it's like a I'm just like totally obsessed with just like at one point I wanted to build like choppers I think it was when the Jesse James had that like web that uh, that TV show about oh, yeah. motorcycles and stuff yep. and I just wouldn't stop that's just like what I was obsessed with I just uh, you know all day all night that's all I would talk about that's all I would think about it's just like I think it's just like an obsessive personality and mm-hmm. that's how it is now I mean and and the cool thing is I found something that has longevity within that ability. I found something where not, I wouldn't say the more obsessed I am, the the better I do, but having that, that I wouldn't even call it a quality, but having that trait Mm -hmm. has allowed me to stay very, very involved every single day and super motivated to a certain degree in uh, about what I'm doing every single day. Like I get home from, you know, from work and then I'm sitting down on my laptop you know, going through YouTube, going through Ergolog, going through, you know, PubMed, um, just like, I like, okay, I'm stopped working, but I'm just actually now I'm just at home. You know what I mean? Yeah. And those are, those are the things that it's not really working. And it's not, you, I couldn't call it working. Now I'm just doing what I like to do. Right. Like I can't do that. I can't do that stuff when I'm at work. I actually have a real job that needs to get done. Right. But when I get home, well, now I can start to look at some, you know, new research coming out. I can start to look into ingredients. I can spend time on, you know, what's going on in, uh, in the industry. What are, you know, other tactics that other companies are doing? And it's just like that until I go to bed. And then half the time, there's some sort of dream that is about something that I was looking up. And then I wake up and then the first thing I do is pick up my phone and then go to my emails. Okay, now I need to start answering emails. And then I'm, you know, taking calls with you know, certain, certain countries, like for example, you know, after five o'clock I'm at home, but that's when I'm mostly dealing with people in Australia because that's their middle of the day. So for me and my personality, um, I don't balance it. There, there's not any balance at all. It's just, yeah, it's just a hundred percent, you know, supplements. (laughs) Yeah. You're all into it. And it's, I, I, that sounds so much like my days, you know, my, my writing, the, the brunt of my writing is done in the morning when I feel like my brain is most active. It goes back and forth. Some days I'm feeling more productive in the afternoons, but you know, more days than not, it's my brain is you know buzzing first thing in the morning. That's when I get the, the really intensive writing done. That, that's um, only that's only because you woke up and you took two Nootropamax, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah well, okay. Funny thing I, about that, I actually had a dream about Nootropamax the other night, and I always have my phone. It's on airplane mode when I go to sleep, but it's always right next to me. So I popped up notes or pages on my iPhone, and I wrote the entire intro to an article. And then turned the phone off and fell back asleep. But I kept dreaming about that. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's this obsession. I know exactly what you're talking about. Or if I'm cooking dinner for us at night, I, uh, I've i got a podcast that I'm listening to in my headphones. That's either on, you know, nutrition or, you know, a, a company or an ingredient or some other kind of new workout program. That's just whatever the fitness, just so I can con- constantly keep abreast of what's going on. You know, whether what are the emerging trends? What are the, what is the science saying? What are people like, uh, Mike is telling Brad Schoenfeld and Eric Helms and all of these guys, what are they, you know, seeing in their studies and research with athletes? So it's, and it's, it's always changing. So you have to, if you want to be relevant within the podcast that you're doing and, you know, just within the industry as a whole, it's, it's almost like you, there's no other option. You just have to stay up on that type of stuff because mm-hmm. on a day to day basis, you know, new research is coming out. Ingredients uh, that we once thought were really good. Aren't great anymore. Ingredients that we thought, you know, 
didn't work at all. Now there's this new emergent study that shows, well, you know, if it's paired with this or if you did this dosage, now it's effective. So it is something that, you know, within this specific industry and how fast everything changes, it's almost a necessity um, to be uh, that obsessive like you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, we've, we've brought up my, my favorite product in the Performax arsenal a few times now. So how did you craft this little beauty that is Nootropamax? What went uh, into why why choose I guess things like CDP choline over alpha GPC? Um, you know why use teacrine at, at 50 milligrams instead of you know 100 or 25 or 150? Like we've seen teacrine dosed all over the map. So walk walk me through just because it's my own personal gain. What what was going through your mind when you made this? There, so there was an an initial synergism. And it actually started out as a real simple product. I almost was going to like call it like a simple series or something. Mm -hmm. And it was CDP choline, new pep and hooperzine. Like there's some real strong, there's some real strong synergism there. I think that'd be a really cool, um, and obviously like a small dose of caffeine. I think that'd be a really cool, uh, uh, simple, cheap combo that would be like incredibly effective. And so it was something where it's like, yeah, we can come out with this, you know, we could probably sell it, you know, for 15.99 or 19.99. And literally like a simple series style product. And then, you know, we started just looking um, into more uh, of the ingredients that would then come along with synergism uh, with those and then how we can kind of take it up a notch. Um, and so, you know, part of it is you, you want a nootropic that's going to last uh, quite a bit, right? So you're going to want something that, that has an extended effect. Well, there's a Japanese study that shows when you combine L-ornithine with caffeine, um, the the actual office workers, which now we're getting into clinical studies that are exactly for the demographic that would take this. Correct. It's not, you know, just a random freaking, you know, Taekwondo people. It's literally <laughs> office workers. Um, don't, it's taekwondo. I don't, I'm a Taekwondo person. Don't that's a, I don't know if, if there are such thing as Taekwondo people, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, it was office workers that co-administered caffeine along with L-ornithine and it, they reported, they felt an increase in mood, focus, and um you know well-being for upwards of eight hours okay yeah. so now we, now we need to start testing with that but before we start adding that into the original synergism you know the original three compounds we need to first test that by itself okay now we test that by itself okay now we can add in that with the other three ingredients and start to see how that feels right mm -hmm. now we need something where okay it's pretty much a, a hundred percent acute we need to be able to um i'd like it to get better with the, with with time, I'd like it to have a um a a, a benefit where the the more you take it, the better it's going to work, and yeah. that's where the COPA came into it. The mm -hmm. COPA studies show that after an extended period of time, then you're actually getting a real cognitive enhancement, yeah. um, more so than just this acute you know mental stimulus that gets you focused for now. We wanted it to get better with time. Now I'll interject there and say. Um, that was one of the one products, I think the only other one was Fitmax, uh, Nootropax and Fitmax, where I actually formulated it alongside um, somebody else that that helped, basically, that kind of gave some ideas, maybe we should try this, maybe we do that. Um, that person's name is Spencer, and mm -hmm. he was uh, from the uh, Anabolic Minds. And so, you know, I um, basically said, hey, look, these are my ideas, you know, let me know what you think. And that just goes back to the whole like kind of running the business thing, right? Because I can't just sit here and just, you know, only do formulate. I'm like, okay, you know, I have to answer these emails. Ch check this out. Tell me what you think. Then he comes back with his thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then I get my thoughts, you know, and then he wants to want to use rhodiola. I don't want to use rhodiola in this, in this specific formulation. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, we kind of went back and forth and we ended on um, the nootropmax that we have today. And I would honestly put it up against literally any other nootropic. Now, is it a kind of caffeine heavy maybe or stimulant heavy nootropic for sure. So am I going to put it up against a stim free nootropic and say it's better? No, but if you want a nootropic that has a good stim effect with some really good focus, mm -hmm. I would honestly put nootropic max up against any nootropic on the market right now. Yeah. And especially if you go and look at all the best sellers on Amazon or whatever, all of them are a tremendous prop blend of, you know, between 15 to 20 ingredients none of which are dosed anywhere near the clinical range, but somehow they're getting the, the number one slot on Amazon. And it's, it's absurd when there's an openly dosed product that's actually effective as hell. And, uh, you know, just, it, it, it 
befuddles me. Most underrated on the market. Yeah. That's the, the brand, the best one you never know about or ever hear about. That makes me good. Yeah, I figured it would. But uh, yeah, man, it's it's just y'all have y'all have knocked that out of the park with that product. I I love it. I've got you know one bottle here that I'm holding on to right here. There's it's I haven't cracked the seal on it because I've got a few sample packets from maybe four or five months ago that I that I'm weaning out just to just to hold on to. So got it. But uh, that I was gonna say that, and you've named my two the I think the two favorite products in the arsenal are Nootropamax and Fitmax. And uh, are there any new developments coming out with Fitmax? Any new flavors on the horizon or anything? Um, to be honest, no. Uh, there isn't any new flavors. That's one product where I think we, like you said, we knocked it out of the park. But we really just need to um, get it in people's hands more. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we just re- recently did a big run of sample packets of that. We're you know getting it in everyone's hands, get giving it to the stores. Um, we just need to get more traction on that product before, you know, we can justify coming out with a third flavor. Um, mm-hmm. And it just goes back to that whole like marketing thing. You know, it's yeah. it's we're putting out one of the best products on the market. Mm-hmm. Simply not enough. It's just not even close to enough. You know yeah. what I mean? There's so much else that comes along with that. So, yeah, with Fitmax, um, it's like even uh, Derek, you know, our VP, it's by far his best, like favorite products. Like, yeah, I like Hypermax is really good. I like, you know, um Stim Max, like all the it's Fit Max, just the feeling, the the amount of euphoria and and well being that you get on Fit Max is like unparalleled by like any other product that we have. Yeah, and I've told you that exact same thing in our conversations in the past. That stack that up against any of the other stim based products. If I'm if I'm going into a, a workout and I want to use one to as the stim component of it. Fitmax knocks that out of the park. It's it's got just the right amount of caffeine for me. The mood enhancement from the urea. And, you know, top to bottom, I, th- I find that to be the, the best stim profile in the arsenal of the Performax stuff. Yeah, no, I agree. What is your uh, daily supplement regimen? You're a guy that's, you know, up, I'm assuming, fairly early and working still at night. So and a lot of things to do in the day. So what is your typical supplement stack look like? So it really just depends on whether I'm like actively, you know, like really in it in terms of the the gym or whether I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of off of off of that 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 uh, schedule. Yeah. If I'm if I'm, you know, in it, it's usually a scoop and a half of Fitmax right when I wake up. So, mm-hmm. you know, waking up 630 or so, um, scoop and a half of Fitmax, um, literally, you know, go to the kitchen, scoop and a half of Fitmax, get back in bed, get on my phone, you know check check my emails check you know social check everything and then i you know in the gym i'm drinking uh e-amino max mm-hmm. and then i get home and i uh um you know cook breakfast go to the office and i'm at the office and then generally around i would say probably 12 mm-hmm. i pop in two more neutro two neutro max and that gets me basically through the rest of the day like i'm a i'm a pretty like stim heavy guy though like i take a i generally take a lot of stims yeah uh, Sometimes, you know, there might be a bang, you know, in there at some mm-hmm. point that might kick the neutral max back a couple hours. because maybe I have a bang at like 11 and then I take my new at uh, neutral max at, you know, two. Um, and so in terms of like stimulants, that's that's, uh, you know, kind of the stack right now. Um, I definitely do hypermax in the morning sometimes. But right now, it's, it's mainly been the fit max. Yeah. Um, in terms of like day to day style supplements. Uh, I only do two carb meals, you know, uh, breakfast and then lunch. So there's two caps of Slim Max before mm-hmm. each one of those meals. And then I'm taking two Alpha Max right when I wake up and then right before I go to sleep. And that's pretty much the, the entire supplement regimen. Um, I am taking some protein, um, mm-hmm. uh, which is, you know, what we're coming out with. So, you know, yeah. I've got to get the hands-on testing. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, that's probably the, the bulk of, of my supplements per day. Do you, are you, would you, are you, let me see how I'm going for this. Would you want to say if it's a single source protein or a blend of protein sources, or would you rather just keep that on the download for a little, for the, for the time being? Yeah, I'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and keep that one on the download for now. Okay. All right. <laughs> you know, good try though. Yeah, I figured I'll figure it out. I figured I was going to try to see, you know, it, you know, we'll see. We'll, we'll keep, we'll stay tuned to the stacked headlines. Right. So um, and I'll get I'll get you out of here on this 
these last two questions. What is the five-year plan with the brand? Where do you see yourself in five years with them? And what would you tell a consumer who has never tried Performax? What first product should they try? Um, in terms of five five-year plan, um, that, that's difficult, right? Because I, I I could give you like a grandiose style. This is where I'd like to be. Yeah. Uh, but I just I I, I I couldn't say that wholeheartedly because you never you never know. Um, what I'd like to be able to do with Performax is start to scale it to be just a more mass market style brand. I think there's some things that we need to do um, as a company, which we will probably start to do um, throughout 2019 to position us to be able to be that, you know, um, really, really, really diving deep into the compliance, making mm -hmm. sure that, you know, uh, we crossed our T's and dotted our I's. Um, and I'd like to, you know, make it a, a, a major, major player. I think, it would be good for the industry because we're just so focused on putting out really good product. Yeah. So I think, you know, we can compete within that realm. And that's how I've always seen it. I've always seen Performax as a legacy brand in the making, mm -hmm. right? We might not be the most exciting this year or just come out of the woodwork and just blow it off the doors. Yeah. But year after year after year, we are going to continue to put out the best product on the market by our standards. We're going to continue to scale and continue to grow. And, you know, whether that is five years or whether it takes 10 years, I believe, you know, Performax will be a massive, um, uh, almost like a, a legacy brand at, at, at a certain point. And that would be my end goal. I know um, Singerman has come out and said that he's going to have, you know, or probably pretty darn close at this point, uh, the biggest, you know, biggest brand in the industry. And I yeah. don't doubt that. I couldn't make that claim for myself. I don't think that, you know, that's where we'll, that's not even the goal. The goal yeah. is to be a, a major player in the industry that is ho hoping to set a standard of quality where we can, we can push the competitors to kind of like, all right, guys, look, you know, your marketing's fantastic and your ads are killing it. Um, but you need to work on the products a little bit, you know what I mean? <laughs> And so I hope that um, I hope that we can get to a point where we're a big enough player that we're pushing competition to to kind of follow suit with the types of formulations they're making. Yeah, awesome. And, it, and what was the the question about the oh the, the first product that it have a consumer take? It really just depends on the person. It really just depends on who they are. But I think any entry level, I think really the introduction to any brand is their pre workout. So mm -hmm. I would say um, Hypermax is probably probably a good option to start. Um, you're going to, you know, see the type of quality that we put into our products. Um, you're going to get an amazing effect. It's arguably one of the best on, on, on the market. And I think that would then hopefully lend that person to go, okay, well, what else do they have? You know, let me check out their Oxymax. Let me check out their Alphamax and, and hopefully kind of move in that direction. But I would say as an introductory product, Hypermax is probably the one that I think people should kind of give a try because um, I think they'll be impressed. Cool. Awesome, man. Well, uh, this was a blast. Thank you for being so generous with your time. Uh, keep kicking ass with Performax and uh, best of luck on growing the company to become a legacy. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate you having me on and uh, I'm sure I'll be on again soon. Absolutely. All right. Take care. All right. You too.